All right, I think we're ready to begin. So I, I'd like to introduce the last member of our panel, uh, of, our, of our dais group up here, and that is my colleague Angelique Dwyer of the Department of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures and the Latin American, Latinx and Caribbean Studies program, who was uh, the other co-chair of this year's conference. And um, An Angelique will be in uh, leading, moderating this panel. Thank Angelique. you very much. And thank you to Dr. Alper for that very insightful presentation, uh, jam-packed with a lot of uh, information regarding both what aids and hinders uh, autistic youth in terms of technology. Um, so at this time, we'd like to open up uh, with questions from the panel. I believe Dr. Bachetu has a question. Yes, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you for that amazing talk. Uh, it was really interesting, and it chimed with some of the literature that I read when I uh, look at loneliness in marginalized groups. So, of course, autistic uh, kids and autistic adults are one of those. And um, one of the things that we uh, read a lot about is this idea of um, fraught interactions, or at the very least, uh, unsatisfying interactions, uh, when, when they involve uh, neurotypical with uh, autistic um, individuals. Um, and uh, a lot of the research on that, of course, takes the perspective of the non-autistic person talking about how unsatisfying they thought the interaction was. Uh, often the autistic person actually doesn't really necessarily feel the same, although sometimes yes, of course. But of course it's interesting when you look at articles that look at two autistic people interacting together, that no longer is the case. People are perfectly happy. So there is a lot of uh, what, what more broadly in, in, in psychology we call intergroup misunderstandings, right? So this idea that um, if you're interacting across any lines, things don't go necessarily very well, at least in the beginning. And so I do have a question, and the question has to do with whether you've observed in your research um, in a completely different media, right, so online media, online interactions, whether you've found that that is also the case, or whether that media somehow erases some of those difficulties that autistic people and non-autistic people might have when interacting. Because of course, even the very fact that many of those interactions are asynchronous might give people a little bit more pause, a little bit more time to reflect and think about what the other person might mean, and so on. Up to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there is a, there is a host, when it comes to, I guess, online interactions, while there is more research in general in the world of autism on kids than adults, the research on like online communities of autistic people is more about adults than about kids. Mm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the ma one of the major issues around why online communities might be kind of more welcoming is, A, I think it's important to think about how there's been some research on how autistic people might have been the first, some of the first groups to form communities online in general. And so in part, like the ways that we use the internet or think about kind of socialization um, has in some way, I think, been shaped by listservs and sort of early communities that developed online. But I think one of the key elements of that is eye contact. So there is research, you know, about how autistic people report physical, you know, anxiety, the f negative physical impacts of being forced to make eye contact. Um, and so a lot of these studies or a lot of these robots that are built are designed to make them make eye contact. Um, when there's a, a whole host of research that says, hi, we're autistic people, we are physically uncomfortable doing that. And, autis and non-autistic people who say, but this is how I communicate and you should be communicating like how I communicate. Mm. So, um, but some of those social cues might be reintroduced if we think about it is still mediated, but like Zoom and video chat. So that adds an additional layer of, well, what kind of scaffolding might you need to support more positive, um, you know, phys like chat, video chat interactions. And there was some research that came out of Microsoft um, during the pandemic that was like, well, what kinds of like add-ons might you need. Like it's not just about closed captioning. It might be other kinds of mood or like interpret interpretation elements or just how to, you know, if people, a lot of times in some industries, you know, neurodiversity is kind of a buzzword and then it's not acted upon in any, you know, tangible way. So some of the tech companies I think have tried, because there are, whether they kind of know it or not, a lot of neurodivergent people in their ranks. And so thinking about how these tools can be developed. So I'd say, but at the same time, you go online and there's, you know, you can encounter so much terrible, ableist, 
um, anti-autistic stuff that's about vaccines or that's, you know, like horrifying. So the internet giveth and the internet taketh. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, any other question from the panel? Yes. Dr. Tynes. Um, I'm just wondering how do black people know that their stories are safe with you? Um, cause the story that you told about Amaya just reproduced stereotypes of black people as violent. Um, cause she's watching violent videos, right? And so I'm sure everybody is thinking, you know, oh, violent, you know, black girl, right? And so just talk a little bit about the choice to use that example. Um, and yeah, how, how do they know they're safe? So, I mean, so I think, it, so she was, I think I kind of prefaced by saying autistic people are more often the, the victims of, of assault than anything else and tried to frame it as in the absence of being able to talk with somebody licensed. I talk more about it in the book um, and I kind of abbreviated things here. There's a lot that we leave on the cutting room floor, but it's definitely about in the absence of having the adequate access that she needs, um, YouTube has filled this void for people in a way that um, acts upon them and preys upon them um, and monetizes them. So how people know that they're safe with me, um, I think is a continually open question. I think the main thing is that she's not the only, you know, they're not the only black family that I have talked to in the research. I think that would be criminally irresponsible to do. So I think the multiplicity, so in the book, the majority, I mean, this isn't just specifically thinking about black individuals, but you know, the majority of the population is non-white that I've been speaking to, which is a complete counter to what autism research is in general. It is so very white, or it doesn't report race at all. So I think that, you know, the question of, of safety also involves like interpersonal, I suppose, relationships. The, 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 the people are able to ask me questions at any time. Um, I don't come in as the expert. I come in as somebody who, who truly just wants to listen. Um, and I also revisit people. So I, so I know that there's a time when the story might, have, might end for me, but it then doesn't end for them. And if I have continuing questions, I need to recontact and find out. So like there was one black family where I, I needed to know, I wanted to know what happened when the pandemic started. Was this situation that they were in like still ongoing and did, did things change? So I, so I think the responsibility isn't that it isn't just to one individual, but it's about showing the multiplicity of those experiences. And also I think the other part is joy. So it isn't just focusing on like you have to talk about these very real issues because they were not issues that a lot of the white families that I was, you know, talking with were experiencing. But I also think that just only, ta only talking and focusing on sort of the negatives. There's um, a really wonderful um, Afro-Latina neurodivergent artist, um, Jen White Johnson, who has an autistic son, who's written a lot about autistic joy. And so those kinds of expressions online through art, through music, through dance, through stimming, um, and so capturing some of that as well is part of the responsibility that I take on too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yes, Dr. Loy. Um, so I'm curious about kind of like through your conversations with um, the, the kids as well as their families with kind of uh, uprise in um, mobile mental health or um, you know, online services, how are they responding to sort of, you know, maybe greater availability of these resources um, or, or do they feel more constrained because a lot of these resources are not addressing their needs as people struggling with autism or um, have, you know, some distinctive needs and or other challenges? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, well, I think there's, you know, there's broader issues around telehealth that we can talk about that apply to autistic populations, but other populations more broadly. So, you know, just because you have the, the internet and maybe, you know, what kind of internet access do you have? Do you just have it through your phone? Do you just have it through like a Metro PCS data plan? Do you have, you know, high speed, you know, Wi-Fi in your home? So that, 
changes the quality of the kinds of, you know, virtual kind of support that you could even get, let alone the, then the quality of those services um, absolutely change. And so I think, and that also depends on the technological capacity of the person on the other end. So if there's like a support, you know, parent or relative who's there with the autistic person or child, you know, doing that, that research, that person has to be tech savvy to some extent themselves. So you have all these built in other digital inequalities that then you add into the mix. So for some folks, the availability of, you know, what you can do virtually, just there is no replicating that in the, in the virtual space. So like occupational therapy is very physical. It, it involves sort of a sensory integration component and parents can buy things off Amazon or try to, you know, put things together, but it's not the same as going someplace physical. So there are a lot of folks who, yeah, experienced major gaps and who were, the people who were experiencing the most gaps before, which were very often sort of black Latino populations in the US, um, rural populations as well, where there's just not enough providers. Um, you know, those, those were also folks who, you know, were not getting as much out of these experiences as they could. Um, but there's other forms that are kind of more adaptable, I think, you know, if we're talking about speech therapy, like things that can be made more interactive and take advantage of the affordances of online spaces. But so much was put together that was, you know, last minute, you know, slapdash, um, despite, I think, individuals' best efforts, the infrastructure just so often was not there. Any other remarks or questions from the panel? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, we've, I think we've talked a little bit already about how social and digital media have um, replaced, for some people, in-person connections, which might be more meaningful. Mm -hmm. And for autistic children, I'm wondering, is there research, either yours or other research, that shows that sometimes it, that just the overconsumption of digital media might be harmful and that it's, it's uh, sort of a replacing potentially more challenging in-person connections, which might ultimately be more supportive? Yeah, I think that the kind of displacement effect, as that's been called, and that's been used whether it's, you know, talking about obesity rates, you know, is media use replacing, you know, going outside and going outside to play? Um, I think you have to think about, you know, the kinds of social opportunities that kids have in the first place and how is media filling that void? So, you know, there are a lot of, for example, social skills programs that are designed around sort of forcing autistic kids to be neurotypical and about sort of, you know, not necessarily based on their interests and using that to then support social engagement. So I think you always have to think about, well, is it, is it, displacing, is it displacing something that is high quality or not? Um, there is some research thinking about how um, transitions may be very hard, um, especially if you're overstimulated, to then move on to like another activity that, so, that media in general that in terms of sensory processing, yeah, that can, that might be something you have to sort of, you know, manage. But there's other things like, so I think we haven't talked about this, maybe we'll talk about it more tomorrow, but sleep and young people and mental health and how much that really, you know, does go together. And so for a lot of autistic people, say a lot, you know, we wish there was more research on our sleep because we, they, they, there's a tendency for neurologically to not have really great high quality sleep, um, for to have disrupted sleep and how that can impact mental health as well. And so with media, you know, media can be a thing that keeps things up and disrupts their sleep, but also it could be the kind of thing that instead of waking up somebody else in the home, yeah, they're going on the iPad because they're already awake and, you know, the parent doesn't want them to disrupt their sleep either. So it, what, what things are causal, what things are circular, what things are correlational are really hard to thread apart. Mm -hmm. Yes, one more question, Dr. Gunn. Thanks, one more question, yes. Um, I, I was really struck by a juxtaposition or a contrast in your presentation at the beginning. 
you warned us about how you would use language and how the community itself rejects the kind of medical diagnosis, autism spectrum disorder, which is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, mental disorder is the Bible of psychiatry. Um, and so we were careful, you were very careful to use correct language and to acknowledge the fact that there's kind of a rejection of the sort of disorder frame of reference around this set of experiences. And at the end, I was interested because you closed on describing, uh, mentioning, not really describing behaviors that you said would seem very unhealthy. And of course, that's a judgment about health coming from an expert. And it just led me to wonder, okay, wait a minute now. So on sometimes we have judgments about health that are professionally mandated, that people accept, but then they're contested by people. Um, and, and so how do we, <laughs> as experts, as people in society, come to terms with and make sense of our judgments about what's healthy and unhealthy and whether or not uh, to apply disorders and labels and categories and how to navigate and negotiate communities who might have different ideas about this. Yeah, no, I mean, I certainly think a lot of it has to come from the community itself to say what what is making my life harder and what do I feel like I can make personal behavioral changes and it's beyond just me on my own trying to change something for me to feel better about myself and who I am and who I want to be for other people. So, um, I mean, yeah, it, I, I guess I, would, I speak somewhat personally from the perspective of talking about eating disorders and disordered eating, but I, I think that we can think about what, what are things that put people's lives at risk actively. I mean, in the same way that we should be talking about police violence in terms of public health, um, the ways that we should be talking about things that we might not characterize under sort of the health undertaking, but is very much a health issue. Um, so I think, yeah, it kind of crosses different ways, but it is absolutely rooted in who are the communities that are most impacted by something that they identify as a stressor in their life that it might be beyond their immediate ability to change. Should we take a question from the audience at this time? So with so much of the algorithms of TikTok, et cetera, driving suggested content, how can parents, professionals, teachers be proactive or support children so they do not fall into the negative effects of this when the child cannot always understand what is quote unquote appropriate? They're teens after all, so not willing to share what they're watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can't say don't use the app because, or you can, but sometimes that makes kids want to use it more. Um, I, I mean, there is, for example, a lot of families don't know that there is a TikTok for kids setting. There is a um, Instagram for kids setting that is sort of a parent monitored version of that. Um, but YouTube Kids, for example, is an app that exists, and I write about it in the book, none of the kids were using it. None of the kids wanted to. A lot of parents didn't even know about it, and YouTube keeps pushing, oh, we've, we have this YouTube kids. We're you know, super responsible. We're pushing all of this, and if that's not what actual kids are using, um, and then you, you say, well, this is YouTube, and so we don't, you know, it's not for kids, and so we don't have to follow things like COPA, like the Online Privacy Protection Act for kids, um, then it's like, if we don't know it, we don't see it. So I think that the distinction of what's for kids and what's not, these companies make these versions available, but then they, all, they didn't start from that place. They didn't center what kids' rights are in the building of these technologies. So it's an afterthought and it, and it shows. Um, so I, I know I've talked, I talk in the book about, some, it's like non-networked sandboxes to be able to play with performance online to be able to, to practice like, having an audience choosing what you post. Mm -hmm. um, whether I was talking about this with somebody earlier, but about like a private album on like Google Photos or something that like only your family sees, but people can comment on. So you practice taking your own photo and, but without, you know, kind of the corporate data mm -hmm. sort of you know, mass consumption of what kids are doing mm -hmm. online, that there needs to be more of those kinds of spaces to practice mm -hmm. um, without it having immediate real world implications. Because as for, you know, the algorithms, it's really multiple algorithms all at once. And um, it's, it's a black box. And so we don't, you don't know what to, sh how it is shaping your kid. And yeah, it's, it's, it's scary. <laughs> Um, but I think we have, to, we have to have those conversations with kids, even if they might be awkward or 
you know, you don't want to, you know, sound like you don't know what you're talking about in front of your kid, but it's okay because um, they could teach you a lot too. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder almost, uh, I, I kind of maybe in some ways juxtaposition like um, parental, like racial socialization or ethnic socialization in some ways. I wonder maybe what do we think about like parents' roles, like especially with kids and teenagers who are exposed to wide array of information, digital information and disinformation like you've talked about, kind of like have parents maybe not necessarily like filter through like show me what you've seen, right? But kind of talk about, like, prepare them in some ways, um, like what to anticipate, how to differentiate some things that may be harmful, some things that may be inappropriate, either developmentally or kind of promoting negative sense of identity. Like, is there research on that? Or sort of how do we consider the role of parental socialization around the, like, appropriate use of digital media? So there's a theory, there's... um in communication research, something called parental mediation. It's basically thinking about all the different ways that parents can be involved, or essentially grandparents too. Like we think, think about like what family looks like, who are caregivers in any given household. Um, you know, thinking about is that restrictions and rules? Is that using media together? Is that actively instructing kids about what's in media? is that just playing kind of a basic supervisory role? So I think I was trying to also kind of get across in, in talking about Amaya and Kimberly, like Kimberly was actively engaged in instructive mediation. Like she was trying to talk about what her daughter was seeing, trying to understand it, and trying to, if it was having a negative effect on her, try to lessen that effect. So, you know, parents were very active in trying to shape media messaging, um, shape what their kids encountered, but yeah, sometimes the algorithms are too powerful. Like sometimes they, they take over. Um, and so it's this constant active trying to stay ahead of things um, and trying to be aware of also at the same time what, like, what makes kids happy. And sometimes you don't want to take away the thing that you think is making them happy too, especially if they're already struggling with mental health. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I think for me, it's a, it's a much larger question that we're asking like so much of what is taught like you were saying like restricting and like all of these but like we can't restrict people from the experiences they're gonna have like even on like the kids version of TikTok there's assumptions that are being made there are stereotypes that are there it is you know rooted in all the things that humans are rooted in because it's made by humans and so it's really about for me helping kids be critical consumers of the information that is around them and the social interactions that they're having, uh, whether that is online, whether that is person to person, because like, you know, people start to notice quote unquote difference from a very young age. And I think that that means that we need to start talking about like, what does, the, what do these things mean? What does it, what implications does that have on you? Because based on all of our intersecting identities, that means very different things. Like that impacts our emotional safety, our physical safety. And I think that is really what, you know, we should be talking about. Not because, you know, we can restrict all we want, but when we walk out the door or when someone's looking at something that's not restricted, like they're going to be surrounded by the messages, whether we want them to or not. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're in the middle. Mm-hmm. And they have to develop the tools. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Okay, so we have another audience question. Do you think portrayal of mental health in TV shows and movies are helpful or harmful for youth with mental health issues to be exposed to? So going back a bit to myths, stereotypes, and Dr. Tyne's question uh, earlier. For example, a fictional show like Atypical or reality shows like Love on the Spectrum have a lot of stereotypes, but is it beneficial to show some of the struggles autistic people go through? According to the like autism community, those shows are not the best. <laughs> um, there's a lot of critiques, and that being rooted in that the creators themselves, the writers, the people behind the camera, are not autistic. Mm. And so it's really thinking about, and that's a broader question about Hollywood in general. It's like who's telling the stories, who's making, who's calling the shots, who's making the decisions. And so, yeah, I mean, obviously, also there's casting and there's, you know, what stories are being portrayed. But that, you know, that goes all the way back up. Thinking about, for example, deaf um, members of the deaf community. You know, in, in one sense, the movie that won the Oscars this past year, Coda, 
mm-hmm. you know, in one sense brought a lot of exposure about the deaf community to the public, um, but also there was this pushback that it centered a daughter of deaf individuals who was, who was hearing, and the ways in which like her deaf relatives were a vehicle for her growth and her development. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there might be stories, but like whose stories are they really Mm -hmm. is a, is a question that, and also the other thing is when it comes to disability representation, um, the, a lot of people who like win Academy Awards for, for playing a, a character who has a disability without being disabled themselves. I mean, you win awards, you Rain Man, you know, you, that's what you win awards for. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's something that is deeply historically, you know, rooted. But I think to, if we broaden our idea of what history is um, and where you can find disabled, you know, histories um, and think about, thinking about like what narratives can be told I think that there's a lot of, um, I think there was some discussion, for example, when the movie Harriet came out, thinking about Harriet Tubman and her relationship to disability was something that a lot of dis- black disability activists we wanted to see more of, because they're like, this is part of our disability history. And we wish that this was more like widespread, that more people thought of this as part of disability history too. So understanding, you know, how multifaceted characters get to be the stories that are told. Um, And and for me, I guess, a lot of that comes from like following communities on Twitter. Um, For me, Twitter as like a researcher, I guess, um, there's a lot of exposure that I don't, that I definitely know in my everyday life would not have opportunities to explore, which I know then also can be extractive. A lot of researchers um, kind of don't do work Kind of that involves kind of communities in in that way, but there's a lot of exposure to to questions and issues and pushback that I think is really important for researchers not to ignore. Mm-hmm. Once you see it, you you have a responsibility not to ignore it. Mm-hmm. For our audience members who might want to learn more about how to engage with the autistic community and how to learn more about this group, I mean, I know uh, you shared with us, Dr. Tyne, some apps on Calm and different things that that uh, audience members can use. But do you have any recommendations there for audience members? Gosh, um, I feel like there's leaders I can point to who you could follow on Twitter. So um, Lydia Brown is a she um, has done a lot of work on intersectionality and autism and um, autistic people of color sort of funds. Um, so there's a book called All the Weight of Our Dreams. Um, that's a, I think it's called On Living Racialized Autism, which is like a great book to tap into. Um, you know, there's different networks, like I think it's the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network um, is another group. There's also in communities, certain local groups as well um, um, that people can tap into um, as well. But I would say that there are some organizations that what I talked about, are they led by members of the community? Have they historically centered the voices of people in the community? I don't even want to mention some of those other groups um, because they don't deserve the publicity, but that have not historically done that. Um, so wanting to kind of shine a light on some of these um, groups that are kind of doing some very necessary work. Great. Well, do we have time for another or should we move on? Absolutely. We have quite a... We, Excellent. We can go till 3.30. So does critical media literacy education look different for autistic adolescents? One of our audience member asks. Mm-hmm. How, do, how can this education be done without making the assumption that social media and social technology is primarily harmful to disadvantaged, underrepresented groups? So that's, I feel like that's a question I have a grant application in right now to study. <laughs> so I'm like, I could be able to get, you know, back to you on what that education looks like um, once I have done the actual study. But, but I will say um, there's a lot of research that hasn't been done, but some research that has been done shows that autistic youth may be more risk averse online than neurotypical youth. So it, in some ways to not assume their lack of savvy but to start from a more strengths-based approach and think about what, what do they bring that might be uniquely um, an asset in this space. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there are other challenges as well. So research is just starting to, I think, emerge in that way, but I think it's important not to just think about 
like what they lack, or in general, marginalized groups. Like, here's all the terrible things that the internet may bring, but also thinking about what are the strengths that people bring, what's the joy that they find there. Mm -hmm. um, mental health, I think you have to consider that full picture. I mean, one of the things about the internet is that it's also um, like a, a, a platform with a particular design, with particular colors and, and so on. And there is a little bit of work, uh, particularly um, during the pandemic, uh, when we were teaching so much online, uh, about, you know, how must things look like to be the most appealing and the le least upsetting and tire tiring for people who have any type of neurodiversity. So, um, so there's a little bit of that, which I guess is part and parcel of, of what the internet is about as well, right? So we need to think of it as a, a, as, a, as a whole combination of things, not just this dangerous place where things can happen. Um, yeah. Definitely. Okay, uh, what are some of the specific ways you've seen digital media be an opportunity and a tool for autistic young people? For example, virtual learning during the pandemic. Oh, this is a great question. Um, so there's a website called Scratch. Anybody here ever used it in the audience? Can you raise your hand? So like the young people. Oh, we've got one over here. <laughs> um, it's basically a website for learning how to do computer coding, but it's done in a way that you basically, how you learn how to code is you, you make games and you make animation and you can remix other people's stuff. So you don't have to just start from scratch in a totally intimidating way. And so there are a number of, of autistic kids I saw who, who used it as a platform for self-expression to turn their favorite D&D &D character into this interactive experience and to, um, you know, develop a whole suite of, of projects that they were really proud of. Um, and that that was really, really fantastic. And, and for me, I guess it's always understanding the artifact that that kid has made, but understanding the broader social context around that use. So like that kid in particular, you know, had to switch schools a ton because of being physically bullied. And, you know, that there's this one constant that you can always return to. And for him, that was either, I guess, Scratch or Minecraft. And so the consistency, um, the reliability, the, con the availability of these platforms when there's so much other change and turbulence um, going on was really important. There's another server, sorry, a specific server of the game Minecraft called Autcraft that there's been a bunch of research on that is specifically curated by an autistic dad of an autistic son, kind of curating the space to limit um, cyberbullying to make some mods to the game that make it more accessible um, in different ways. Um, and so those, those are some tools that um, are very exciting for young people to be engaging for, I think for a lot of kids, not just neurodivergent kids, um, but there might be unique opportunities there relative, again, to what other kinds of stressors in their life might exist. And thinking about uh, all three of the presentations we've heard today, are media literacy programs enough to combat identity-based trauma and discrimination online, or should there be increased regulation by social media platforms or the government about what can be put online? What might this entail? And Dr. Ryder mentioned some of the dangers of over-restriction of media. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, our media social media platforms are failing us like, as a society mm -hmm. in terms of what is allowed to be like, actively shared to propagate hate. Um, and I, yes, there, there's the, the days of just companies self-regulate. Um, it didn't used to be that way. Like post-Reagan, it did become that way. Um, is, is not a sustainable, their, their needs. And I think like um, the UK has actually taken the lead in a number of ways of creating something called like an, the age appropriate design code, um, which is trying to force companies to again, like really kind of center what are children's needs emotionally, socially, um, in how these platforms are designed. But no, I think the time for self-regulating, if it ever ever existed, um, it's definitely not, not now. <laughs> and I'd love to hear, I guess, what other folks think as well, but yes, more regulation. <laughs> I'm curious what others um, on the panel have to say about that question. Other thoughts about the role of the media themselves or the role of um, governmental agencies in, in regulating? Other thoughts? This has got to be one that a lot of you have thought about. 
I, I do have concerns about having the social media platforms um, do any of the regulation because they tend to get things wrong a lot when it comes to black people specifically somehow. Um, and so I think that to answer their question, yes, critical media literacy um, is an important tool. It's not the only tool, but it's, I think it's the best way to arm kids to be able to protect themselves because social media platforms won't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw a couple of nods. You're not going to get away with not answering that question if you nodded, Nick and Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll just add that, you know, my worry is um, the other common good that we tend to recognize is freedom from censorship. And so I just worry about anybody who's tasked with trying to decide what we can and cannot see as a society when that may or may not be reflective and representative of a pluralism of views across different kinds of communities and different kinds of uh, locales. So um, I like the idea of the critical, you know, you know, although obviously that is about trying to uh, engender in individuals the ability to manage that. But we try to do that through schooling already. So is it really that different? Anyway, I, I worry about censorship a little bit with respect to these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I echo what's been said, but I also think about there is some like monitoring that's happening already and we already see how flawed it is. Like we have the data that we need to know that it will not happen the way that we would think in an ideal world. And so uh, it just kind of echoes what's already been said. So. I, oh, sorry. Um, just just to, add, to add as a public health person, I, I, think, I think the, and social media companies object to the comparison with tobacco or uh, alcohol, but I think it's in some ways a fair comparison. I, I don't think we can deny that there's an addictive component to a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we can't deny that it has major implications for mental health and well-being. I mean, that's what this conference is is discussing. Um, so in that, in that respect, I think uh, we, we, we can't, we, some of the same types, not the same types of regulation, but the same strength of regulation, I think, is going to ultimately be needed to make, turn it into more unambiguously healthy relationship with social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that um, has been said maybe last Q&A um, discussion and also Dr. Arpa mentioned a little bit earlier is who are behind the algorithms, right? Like, um, for example, like Twitter, like if you have a picture with a white person and a uh, person of color, the, the, the sort of the, what they highlight would be that white person. Like usually there's been research kind of showing that. So, and that's because kind of people who are developing these apps or these tools are, um, you know, just like <laughs> the rest of the general society is underrepresenting people of color, you know, gender, um, you know, minority populations and other people who have, have been historically subordinated. So in some ways, probably, I think, you know, for young people, I would encourage you to, you know, like seek the representation in the fields that you're interested in and be that voice to, to, to champion some of those um, changes that we want to see, um, not just like helping people to self-regulate, but kind of change the algorithms too. I'd say also to add one thing, the discussion about whether the internet, it, like, because whether it is an addiction, we can say that it's like a substance, or is it like a behavioral addiction? Because it's, you know, we can, we can think about that, but at the same time, you don't need alcohol or tobacco to get a job. <laughs> you know, you don't need it to, you know, maintain your social ties in ways that now you do, you know, kind of societally require using the internet to do all those things. So, I think that's that's the part that gets kind of tricky when we think about you know telling young people oh you need to you know succeed you need to stay ahead you need to get a job you need to do all these things and that will require you to actively be on the internet um, in the same way that we can't you know regulate e-cigarettes um, it's there might be some overlaps but there's also some of those those big differences. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to quickly add that I think. Um I think this is obvious for, for the panel, but maybe not for everybody, that 
Obviously, when we're saying internet, there's just way too many things we're talking yeah. about, and they're very, very different from each other. And for some things, yes, the concerns that are being voiced are valid. For other things, I would say even the opposite. I mean, the internet is a lifesaver for a lot of people who are very isolated and have no other way of learning about what they're going through, of um, connecting with other people. It's, it's really quite important to keep it out there mm -hmm. and, and not restrict it. So, you know, it really, it, it really depends on what exactly we're talking about. So just, you know, <laughs> stating the obvious, but just making sure it's on, it's on the table. Mm -hmm. I wanted to follow up just quickly. Uh, the word critical has taken a real drubbing in the last several years due to the responses to things like critical race theory. And a number of you are using it in really important ways. And I just wonder if maybe, uh, so critical media studies, you talked about critical digital racial literacy, I believe. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, and I just wonder if some of you could maybe just speak a little bit to the ways that word critical is functioning there, because I think that's really important and I want to make sure that people hear from a variety of voices about how that word critical functions. It's really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it's um, helping people to see um, power dynamics at play, to see structural racism, um, to counter critique um, analyze, synthesize the messages that they get around race, um, to also place those messages in historical context. Um, and so it's sort of a broad range of skills that people develop um, and sort of uh, basically at the core is recognizing and critiquing, um, countering, uh, power and, and, um, and structural racism, basically. Um, yeah, and I've, I've thought about it in those ways and in addition to what it's modifying, it's also relative to how has critical theory like been a part of that field. So whether it's like media literacy, how has it been absent? Um, how um, people have talked about critical disability studies. Um, you know, the idea that disability studies has been very white historically, so critical is trying to also draw, draw attention to that. I, in the work I've done on critical media access studies, is drawing on the work of another scholar who's written about critical access studies, um, scholar Amy Humrai. And they talk about thinking about how access, people just generally think about it in this positive way, like, oh, access, we want more of it, and not thinking about the messy entanglements and the political struggles that have been part of defining what access is, who gets to define it, who gets to wield it in a way that perhaps then leads to the removing of rights of others in the name of access. So thinking about it in these dynamic ways. And so for me, it's just been applying that, I guess, to the field of media access. Um, and, and for me, kind of from a sociological perspective, thinking about, okay, you make something what you think is accessible, but have you also introduced other than layers of inaccessibility. So, for example, an you know, example is a, you know, a movie that's you know, a sensory-friendly movie screening, but it's 30 bucks, and you can't get to it by public transit. Um, have you really made that accessible? Mm -hmm. So it's thinking relative to other forms of access, um, mm -hmm. comparatively, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, we have another question that came in uh, for you, Dr. Alper. Uh, so many clinics have a 12-month wait list for an autism assessment. Mm. How do you feel about people using information from TikTok and other social media platforms to self-diagnose while they wait for an assessment or instead of a psychological assessment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are very tricky questions. <laughs> um, I think that, as we talked about, like having, obviously, a, a diagnosis can then unlock a lot of things, but it unlocks a lot, especially if you're a child. Because once you age out of schooling, just accessing any kind of like support services gets a lot harder. Mm -hmm. so, so I think as an adult, um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, it's expensive. Not only is there a long wait list, um, you know, I can't find somebody in my area who, who would do it. Um, and so you think about alternatives to that. I think there is there is like discussion. People have these concerns about oh, everybody's self-diagnosing themselves as this now, and so you know, does it even mean anything anymore? Is that taking away from other you know what the what other people would maybe um, get? 
And so it becomes like a discussion about scarcity and scarce, you know, what, you know, fighting over a, like a lack of combined resources instead of thinking about, well, why does this scarcity exist in the first place? <laughs> so it sometimes becomes a distractor to that. So I think people should use whatever tools are available to themselves to, to get access to the supports that they, that they need. And so um, I think when it comes to kids, there's like, there is more of an opportunity to, once you have an official diagnosis, to potentially unlock more services that go with that um, in, in, the, in, sorry, in the public school setting in, in the US. So I think it, a lot depends on like, the availability of resources in one's you know, community in general, the age of the person, um, what their own relationship to a diagnosis is. So there's some interesting work by a sociologist, Catherine Tan, who's wrote about something um, biological illumination. So the, I, the idea that, um, and others have written about how for some folks, the idea of getting a diagnosis is a bad thing. Like, oh no, I've been you know, diagnosed mm -hmm. with X. But the idea in this case of like diagnosis, being an entry point for knowing more about oneself and illuminating parts of them that they that they hadn't um, experienced before, mm -hmm. and so I think it's yeah part of that broader conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for everyone. A question: So multiple speakers have mentioned the importance of a positive group identity. Discovering one's identity is definitely a central component of adolescent development. How do societal pressures, the political climate, and technologies like social media? guide, encourage, and or threaten this crucial part of adolescence? How has this changed over time in the context of the speaker's res respective fields? This is two hours to answer the <laughs> question, but, but just on the, on the last bit, I think precisely what has changed since I started working on this topic, okay, I'm not gonna tell you how long ago, um, <laughs> Is, is precisely agency. People have a lot more, because of things like social media, but not only, but because of, of, of things like that, there are a lot more agency in, in defining what they want to present as and what they want the group and their identity to be presented as. Now, okay, it has limited success perhaps, but it, it offers alternative narratives and alternative versions of what those identities are about which of course was always available, but in a very different scale, and also with m m much fewer people had access to that. So I think that has been a fundamental change. But yes, you know, in a nutshell, there is a lot of, a lot of uh, negative, imp negative impact on identities, um, but also a lot of potential to present them positively and to try and change those narratives. And for others from your respective fields? <laughs> it's either nothing or a lot. <laughs> so for me, when I started doing this work, a lot of the spaces that I would go into were text-based. Um, and so the conversations were still really rich. People were modeling. Um, how to express your, you know, racial identity. So you used to be able to say ASL, your age, sex, location, and then people would add R. Oh, people would add R because they wanted to know your race, right? And then they would use that to, like, go into private rooms and, um, like, connect with people who were the same race or a different race if they were interested in that person. Um, and so people were constructing their identities and you didn't have a lot of these, the visual components um, that you have today, right? And so now I, I, I've seen things get increasingly more heinous, um, mock lynchings, um, burnings of um, black bodies, people seeing, you know, um, police killings, right? And like increasing, like more like experiences like these, like on a daily basis, right? A lot of my talk showed um, how often people are having these experiences. And so you just have to contend with so many more negative messages than you did 
Um, I would say when I first started, and it was just text. Um, and so that has implications for how people are managing and using the message to um, basically say something about who they are. Um, and so I think we, our jobs are a lot harder right now to help people to construct a positive identity because the digital terrain has gotten more treacherous. I think I, I like um, the work uh, by um, Rob Sellers at Michigan. Um, he's kind of talked about in terms of uh, racial identity, sort of the sense of racial private regard as well as racial public regard. So I think sort of with a lot of the um, things that we're seeing um, on like on, in the media and kind of um, vicarious discrimination and kind of negative traumatic experiences does contribute negative, like significantly to public regard that people like, maybe young people like absorb that like yes like society see our group as inferior um, and that is harmful to their uh, psychological health at the same time um, we also see repeatedly that private regards sort of how they feel about you know their connection their belonging to their group can be a buffer against a host array of challenges mm -hmm. and and has a positive uh, association with their mental health you know, just without kind of thinking about adversity. So I think from that perspective, there, there is kind of, of hope in some ways that, um, yeah, th some kids can be resilient. And that's kind of why I think um, a lot of the preparation that parents and, you know, teachers and sitting in the audience and um, adults and peers support for one another can promote that sense of private regard and, and kind of have a collective sense of um, community, and that is so important, I think. Hope is wonderful. <laughs> Hope for the community. <laughs> Other am I, comments? Am I allowed to go back to the previous question? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Sorry, a bit slow here, but um, there's a couple of, of things that I would like to say about the self-diagnosis uh, issue. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is complicated. I think that we've concluded that already, um, but... Um, I think it's uh, potentially very empowering for people to be able to self-diagnose when, for some reason, for example, the typical example of, of girls not being diagnosed as much as boys are simply because they just don't fit that whatever prototype people got into their heads about what autism was about. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, being able to self-diagnose can be very empowering because it gives a voice to people who say, well, I have some difficulties that I could potentially get help with, or I could potentially be um, uh, in initiating a dialogue with people about the fact that we're different, and they don't have that tool because they don't have that label. So I think that's the positive side. But there is a danger also, um, and, and uh, I think it's not that this danger does not mean we shouldn't do it, it just means we need to be aware of it, which is that there are many communities where uh, autism is heavily stigmatized. I think it's generally so, but there are communities where it is a lot more than in others. And so those communities will not be doing the self-diagnosis, which is of course a potential source of inequalities there again. So, so I think with the self-diagnosis issue, even though I would say it's, it's really important to allow that to be a valid source of diagnosis, it's also important to keep in mind that not everybody's going to do it, and uh, we might be missing people um, even more so if, if we don't do that. Sorry for the slow no, no. <laughs> movement of the wheels, but jet lag is to blame. No, great. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for all of your comments. Yes. So I think we should, in order to keep on our time schedule, uh, we should thank our panelists one last time and wrap things up for this afternoon. Uh, Yes, a round of applause. <laughs>And just a reminder that you have several opportunities, especially to explore this conference theme through issues, uh, through the fine arts. And a reminder and an encouragement to our Gustavus Davis students online and in person to encourage you to uh, rush over to Beck Hall, the first floor, where you can interact with all of our panelists in, in ones and twos um, in, an, in a time that's, that will be moderated by our uh, Gustavus student host. Uh, so that's a time especially for our Gustavus students. And for the rest of you, please do enjoy the other um, 
features of the conference, including the, uh, the art shows and things like the out of doors, which is beautiful right now. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. Don't leave anything in the arena tonight uh, because we will be doing a cleaning and so on, and I don't want you to lose anything. So please take all of your belongings uh, with you when you leave, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. <laughs>